like climate change and, and the so-called GP policy that lasted about 14 months, my friend, with the Obama administration because China wasn't even interested. China said, we don't have to work with the United States. We are the number one. We will be the number one power, so we don't have to work with you. So Obama then begins to shift the policy again. Uh, but we continue, for example, the continuity, on the continuity of difference between us and the United States and Afghanistan and Pakistan has more or less stayed the same. It's gone back and forth just brief periods after 9-11, for example. Uh, it's now coming back uh, into a degree of convergence. Uh, under this administration and the Trump administration, after a certain degree of uncertainty, we can start to see this government, the Trump administration moving into a policy uh, that we see a convergence on, on, on the Western Pacific. However, we still see a certain degree of difference in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and we still have a, a lot of difference between us and Trump, for example, on trade uh, and <coughs> trade and investment policies. Uh, again, you play your cards where you feel you can. Uh, the point ultimately, though, is for us is that if China is going to be our primary geopolitical challenge, we are still not strong enough, just on the basis of economics, forget about anything else, uh, to be able to take on China by ourselves. We still struggle to counter Chinese influence in our neighborhood, forget about in, in the South China Sea or the Western Pacific, but even in places like Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, India, is, it, it, it's a huge battle. Sri Lanka has been a huge battle for us, continues to be a battle to keep the Chinese influence uh, at a certain level. So then you need to play as many friends as you can as much as you can, even if it's 50% here, 20% there, 30% there. Um, and so Japan has been one of our biggest friends, but keep this in mind, the Japanese have also gone back and forth. Uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, the present opposition party, when they came to power were pro-Chinese. Luckily for us, the Chinese despised the Japanese so much, they said, we don't care. Even if you're pro-Chinese, we still hate you. So the Japanese, okay, this is not going to work, we have to go back. Uh, uh, and go back to the policy. So now there's a continuity of policy in Japan, a consensus that they have to build up rivals to, to China. Uh, and they've, they've selected India because it's an obvious uh, person to work with. Bharat mentioned Vietnam. It's interesting. When I've worked with the Vietnamese, two things that have struck me um, about the Vietnamese. There is a very strong pro-China group within the Chinese, uh, Vietnamese Communist Party. Some of you may remember Tata Steel tried very hard to set up a $5 billion steel plant in Vietnam, and Indian government made it clear to the Vietnamese, this is going to be a litmus test of our relationship, that you allow Tata to put in a big economic footprint in your country. Vietnam said, fine. Nothing happened. And when I went there and I talked to Tata Steel executives in Vietnam, they said the Chinese are all over the place lobbying against this, and we lost. The, all of Vietnam's problems with the Chinese on the South China Sea, the support of the Vietnamese military, Chinese business interests were able to, to stop it from happening. After that, the Indian side said, okay, we're not so certain you've made up your mind about China yet. Continues to be a problem. Ramos Musal, one of the reasons we couldn't do this, uh, especially in the early phase, was because Russia, which is the other partner, basically said we're not interested in getting on the wrong side of the Chinese. And we're not, we're not, we're not going to support the sale of this missile. But I remember I've, I've been to the Brahma's factory uh, in, uh, in, in Bombay, and I've asked them, they said, why aren't we giving this off? They said the Russians have come in and said, mm -mm. no, we have too many stakes with the Chinese. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's often a very complicated game in which you have all these little pieces playing and your skill really lies in being able to move and also be able to judge where these pieces are moving. And it's not easy. I mean, I, I do this all as my part of my living, as my, uh, my job, and I get confused because you can just be sick nowadays in particular with the decline of American, should I say, not so much American power as America's will to use that power and the rise of China. You see a lot of countries changing their policies at a remarkable rate. And within each country, you will often find two or three factions uh, coming up and having different points of view. Australia. Australia has been America's most loyal ally historically. Every single war America has fought in recent history, a 
Australia is the only Western country that, ha that has always fought along with them, even in Vietnam. No other Western country joined Americans in Vietnam. Australians did. But we look at the Australians, and one of the reasons we are very reluctant to allow them either into the so-called trilateral, and we're now making it quadrilateral, or into the Malabar exercises, naval exercises, has been the fact that we look at Australia and we see a very strong pro-China group within the, within the Australians. And the Australians have been complaining incessantly, saying, how can you seriously believe Australia, of all countries, would ever do something uh, against Western values? And we're saying Western values, as Bharat is correct, values don't matter. In this case, it's about money and influence, and we see a lot of Chinese influence uh, in your country. So we have our worries as to whether or not we can allow you in, and we basically put tests for the Australians to pass. Uh, but this is the kind of game that the uncertainty with which we have to play. But one of the things I will say, Austra America is still overwhelmingly the most powerful country in the world. And in terms of technology, it is so far ahead, definitely ahead of the Chinese, who still can't even build a jet engine. Uh, and the Chinese are the first to admit it when you talk to them, that to not be able to play an America card would be a serious mistake. In fact, the reason why we can get the Israelis and the Japanese to help us, and the, both countries are very clear about this, I'm going to track through dialogue with both of them, uh, both of these countries, and I have been for the past 10 years, is that they make it clear, you have to have the Americans blessing our relationship, otherwise we cannot move forward beyond a certain point. Very, very well put. I think what you're saying is play the America card, but do not let your hand depend only on it. Very good point. I will open the uh, discussion now to questions. And uh, I have several more to ask, both of you, which I'll ask at, at, uh, maybe later. But questions, please. Mr. Bharat. I just wanted, it's a question as well as a, a statement. I, I feel that uh, it's very important for India not to play the card of uh, showing values to the rest of the world, and which we have been doing. You know, we, we've been very uh, uh, worried that what the world will think in acting strongly in various matters like uh, Kashmir and various other. But coming to the point of relationship with America, I don't really agree that it's an unreliable partner. The reason is uh, we have some common interests, very strong common interests. America and Trump are against Pakistan. They are also uh, not supportive of China. And therefore, it, it makes a common objective. And I think if we play uh, a card of carefulness with America, it will go against us. We must aggressively and openly build relationships with them and take them as a strong ally. And I think a, a, a kind of a Japan, India, America and perhaps Russia at some stage they were also keen to join in. If we, if we have these not primarily as an anti-China uh, point but as a cooperation for various things which could incidentally also uh, be to come to China then perhaps it would, uh, would be a good move. So I'd like your comments on this. Yeah, I was wondering when the Pakistan thing would come up. Um, Please, I think one of our, the, one of the, it's, it's a pathology, it's a partition pathology, if I may say so. I'm post-1947, so I don't understand it. But, and most of us, I think, are. And I simply don't understand it. Um, Pakistan, I do not see how, objectively speaking, it's at all a threat. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a military analyst. It is, it was never a threat. It is not now a threat. Can never be a threat. Uh, 
the GDP of Pakistan is one sixth to one seventh of the market cap of the Mumbai Stock Exchange. Please, unless we have a perspective and begin, we've got such fundamentals wrong. I'm hardly surprised we are, we are nowhere in the picture. You know, when you think of Pakistan as a threat of any kind, leave alone credible, it reminds me of the Panchatantra tale. An elephant might jump on a stool when it espies a mouse. That is not the mouse's problem, it's the elephant's problem. When you are spooked by a Pakistan, we have a problem. Because people virtually laugh at you. The reason why I mean, should I be very absolutely honest? The reason we, we are not taken seriously in international circles, I am sure. I mean, you know, I think I've been in the business slightly longer than Pramit here. Um, uh, I'm sorry, but we have no credibility. We need to talk of Pakistan as a threat, and we then try to, uh, you know, slap along with China and try to have a concert with China, all this nonsense. I mean, look, what was our basic problem? Our basic problem has been that our strategic problem is that we have lost the unitariness of the strategic space with the partition in 1947. That's true. Now, what, what happened was the pathology is taking over. It was basically a North Indian thing, and I absolutely, I'm a South Indian. 